This is Where We Live on Connecticut Public Radio. I'm Lucy Nalpathanchel, broadcasting remotely. This Hartford Current headline gets your attention. Nearly 50 shootings in seven weeks. Nearly 50 shootings in Hartford since September 1st. Today, where we live, we talk about what's causing the spike in gun violence and how leaders and community members are working to address it. It's not an isolated problem. Studies show an increase in all firearm injuries as the pandemic continues. That's from the Guns in America Public Media Reporting Project. Coming up, we talk to a public health researcher about the factors leading to increased gun violence in recent months. Now, have you or someone you know been affected by gun violence in Connecticut? You can join our conversation, 888-720-9677. That's 888-720-WMPR. You can also find us on Facebook and Twitter at Where We Live. Joining us now on Zoom is Hartford Mayor Luke Bronin. Mayor Bronin, welcome back to the show. Good morning, Lucy. Good to be with you. I believe uh, this week, just a couple of days ago, there was a fatal shooting of a man on Albany Avenue in Hartford. According to the current, this was the 20th homicide uh, this year. And so when I when I started the show talking about the number of shootings since September 1st, are you surprised? And can you give us a little more detail about um, some of the the events and, and what you've been doing as the city's leader? Sure. You know, we, we are seeing, as you said, said, uh, a, an unusual and severe spike in gun violence over the last seven weeks since the beginning of September. Uh, you know, we began to see gun violence rise uh, after May at the beginning of the summer. And that often happens that you see a, an increase in the summer months. You also usually see a decrease uh, as you get into fall. And mm -hmm. here and around the country, Cities are experiencing the opposite. And I think that there is a complex, nasty stew of causes here. And I think that nobody uh, can say with certainty uh, what exactly the causes are. Uh, but uh, I, I think there's no question that it's tied into just the profound disruption of the pandemic. You know, the pandemic has disrupted every aspect of life for all of us. And uh, for so many, that has included uh, jobs lost, economic disruption, food insecurity. I think that many people in many communities are dealing with a, a heightened, extraordinarily heightened level of anxiety and stress. Uh, and when you have deep underlying trauma that's below that, uh, that can be dangerous. There are also some, some specific disruptions to things like the court system, which really wasn't operating for a while, uh, to in-person uh, probation and parole supervision, which which does play a role, and even to some of the community-based violence intervention work as so much in-person activity of all kinds uh, was disrupted over the summer. Mm -hmm. So there, there are a whole bunch of things at work, uh, and you know, there are many, many things, I'm sure we'll get to them, that we're, that we're doing in response. But I don't think there's any question that what we're seeing now is uh, both severe and highly unusual. And uh, and I think it is deeply rooted in a lot of uh, the disruption of the pandemic this year. Hmm. Let's back up a little bit. You mentioned that there's often a spike in gun violence in the summer months. So when you look at uh, crime data for your city over the last few years and you see again, 50 shootings since September 1st alone. How does that compare, Mayor Bronin, to past years? It, there's just no there's no comparison. We, we have mm -hmm. not had a, a period like that in a long, long time. Uh, in, in Certainly in my memory, we have not had a period like that. We're actually coming off of a period of about five years where we've seen uh, fairly steady declines in most categories of crime, uh, including most violent crime. And even through May of this year, our shooting activity had stayed stable. Now, I, let me say, way too high. One shooting is too many. Uh, one fatal shooting is uh, is is uh, is tragic uh, for our community. Uh, and so we we are always battling the challenge of gun violence. But we had seen the beginning of this year uh, stay pretty consistent with prior years, and then something shifted again pretty dramatically uh, in in June, but truly dramatically in September. Uh, and again, as you've seen in many cities. Uh, now, the fact that it's happening in many cities across the country doesn't in any way diminish uh, our sense of urgency uh, or the, uh, the 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 
damage that it inflicts on our community. We have to do everything we can to battle it. Uh, but I think there's no question that there's some some bigger uh, forces at work here. And we're going to be talking more about some of the factors behind uh, this spike again with Hartford Mayor Luke Bronin. Uh, this is where we live. We wanted to get some community perspective. And so joining us also on Zoom now is Deborah Davis. She's part of Mothers United Against Violence. It's one of the nonprofits in the city that supports victims and their families who've experienced violent crime. Deborah, welcome to our show. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Uh, now, I, I should say uh, that uh, I understand you lost uh, your son, uh, one of your children, back in 2010. Uh, he was killed um, in an incident with a firearm, and I'm so sorry uh, that you lost him, uh, Deborah. Tell us how you got involved with Mothers United Against Violence. Was it when they reached out to you after this tragedy? Absolutely. And um, I, I have to say that Mothers United Against Violence um, at the time for me was uh, probably, and it was, it, it was the most important um, visit that I had during that time because I needed to reach out to someone who absolutely understood what I was going through and had literally been through um, the exact same type of trauma. And so for me, um, I was traumatized, my entire family was traumatized, and um, Mothers United Against Violence represented that kind of organization. Um, they, they did not do it as a perfunctory kind of a duty. They did it um, basically from their heart and because of the experience that they had had. So it was really important for me to have that kind of outreach in the community. So I understand you've been working with Mothers United Against Violence uh, over the past 10 years. We're talking now about a spike in gun violence, uh, 50, nearly 50 shootings since September 1st alone. What's your reaction uh, to what's happening and what are you hearing from community members about it? Well, Mothers United Against Violence has been around since 2003. Um, and literally part of the group had been um, basically providing support to families and compassion and uh, um, just the uh, ju just that kind of support that individuals um, needed during that time prior to 2003 but in formalizing MUAV um, it was it, it, it was critical for Reverend Henry Brown who's a co-founder and Mrs. Henrietta Beckman who's co-founder as well um, their work was really charged with um, Base, making certain that they were able to go directly to uh, the, the victims of violence. And at that time, it was gun violence and it was, and it still is, um, gun violence and violence across the board, even some domestic violence, mm -hmm. um, also um, stabbings. And of course, now we have more suicides. Mm -hmm. uh, but I know that <clears throat> the pandemic, um, with all of the other layers that uh, had existed prior to the pandemic, it has taken a major toll on our community. It has taken such a greater toll that no one ever really um, looked at it and even took a moment to understand how this could even potentially uh, be a breaking point for the um, urban communities. Hmm. So, uh, Deborah, this past uh, month and a half, when you and other members of Mothers United Against Violence are going into the community, talking with families who've been impacted by gun violence, what are they telling you? We are hearing um, everything that we heard from before, which is, you know, lack of educational resources, lack of jobs lack of, of uh, just the peer attention. Um, and of course, uh, sort of coupled with that now is, um, you know, feeling the immense uh, trauma of individuals, you know, becoming more, um, I believe, traumatizing because of the, the conversation um, that um, the pandemic has added to their stress level. And mental health has always been an issue within the community. Um, never addressed the way it should have been addressed. And so now we're hoping that we can certainly get some comfort in that area and some resources in that area. But at the same time, um, yes, people are looking for even uh, sort of double down on everything that, that, that we've actually, and that they've actually been sort of uh, really uh, crying out for. 
and um, you know, young young children um, in school. Absolutely, if they're in half a day school classes now, they need some um, some very important work to do. They need to be um, refocused and redirected with all of the distance learning that's going on. It's not as simple and it's not as easy as individuals think for young people that were um, literally going to school to make sure that their time was absolutely um, used in such a really positive way. Now with some of the distance learning, they're having to basically find other outlets for some of these young people. So that's something that we're, we are definitely communicating about. But then the trauma of the escalation in the gun violence has added to it. And so everyone is worried about a young person being a, um, a victim um, and not even the intended victim and uh, being potentially um, just walking from one part of their, uh, from, from, from their home to maybe a very close location a very close location and just being um, possibly mm. um, victimized by some of the gun violence that we've been having. Mm. And these are unintended, some of these are unintended targets. And so we have to be very mindful and very cautious just for our families. Mm. And they have just also communicated a lot of not feeling totally safe. So that mm. was important. I wanted to ask Mayor Bronin to respond on what you shared, Deborah. You know, there's this idea that violence can be contagious, violence leading to more violence. And so the fact that you're seeing the spike in the, the, your city, uh, Mayor Bronin, and we just heard Deborah say that community members are fearful that they will become targets. How do you just respond to that? Lucy, I, I don't think there's, in my mind, I don't think there's any question that there is a contagious element to violence in general and to gun violence specifically. You know, we we see that uh, in many years there is a, a cycle that builds and grows when there is a spike in violence, uh, and we've, we're seeing that uh, at, a, at a different order of magnitude right now. And I think that uh, Deborah's exactly right. You know, when, when somebody is... L- on the periphery of violence, uh, maybe they fe- maybe they feel threatened by somebody. Maybe they're in a dispute with somebody. Uh, maybe uh, there's a dispute that arises in the moment when they have been hearing and seeing in what is a small community a spike in gun violence. I think it adds to that sense of fear and anxiety and stress, and it can cause some of those disputes to escalate faster, uh, where people uh, pull out a gun faster and use it. And, and, I, and I think that's one of the reasons why you know, our focus right now is on, uh, in some sense, trying to get a fire break, you know, doing everything and anything we can in partnership with law enforcement, you know, both mm-hmm. state, uh, local, federal, working together, as well as with our community partners uh, to really surge in response to try to just press pause because I think the community needs that. And I, I, I do think that there is a contagious element that, uh, that I think nobody truly understands. I, I don't think there's been enough work uh, to, to understand it and to research it. Uh, and so I think the data is, is somewhat limited, but just in my gut, and I think in a lot of the folks uh, who I talk to, uh, you know, gut, there, there's no question that that's an element of it. You can join us here on Where We Live as we talk about gun violence coming up. Uh, we'll also be talking about intimate partner violence and a rise in suicide with a public health researcher. But you can also join us, 888-720-9677. Sean's calling in from New Haven. Sean, uh, what's your question or comment? Yes, how you doing? Um, I visited Hartford. I don't live in Hartford, but I visited Hartford back in uh, August. I had. I, I don't really have a question. It's just something. I was involved in gun violence. Um, I, I have issues with my heart, so I see a physician at Hartford Hospital. And before I went to the hospital to, for my appointment, I stopped at a store to grab something to eat. Uh, while I was at the store, I was actually assaulted and mugged by some individuals. Um, the Hartford, I called Hartford police. I was actually assaulted. They, they fractured my nose. I had a fracture in my face and they pulled out a weapon, a pistol. So they assaulted me and they robbed me from my belongings. Um, Hartford police, they were involved. I called them immediately. 911 was called. I was, um, taken to the hospital. 
My issue is I would like to see Hartford police actually do something about it. Um, they have information on the individuals who did it, but they haven't taken any action. Um, I know the mayor is on the line. This is something that's, you know, I kind of have PTSD from it, so I would like to see something done about it. Um, but I figured I would call in while the mayor was on the line. Maybe maybe this would kind of put some, some, uh, some fire under their butt. Well, Sean, thank you for calling in. Uh, mayor Bronin, how do you respond to this particular incident? I know there's probably more details you need. Sure. Well, Sean, first of all, I'm, I'm so sorry that you went through that, and I'm sorry that you're uh, still dealing with the effects of that. Uh, I, I, I can imagine that um, is, is something that uh, will, will stay with you, and I'm, and I'm really sorry. Um, I, I Obviously, I don't know enough about that specific incident that I, that I can respond to it, but what I can say is that our, our police are out there working really hard, and uh, you know, one of the things that I, as we talk about causes, I think it's also important to talk about things that are not driving this violence. You know, there's been a conversation uh, and, and some people, including uh, some leadership of police unions that have said that what's driving the gun violence is police stepping back, uh, partly in response to the police accountability bill. Uh, I, I don't think that's true. Uh, you know, what I see both uh, on the ground and in talking with our uh, officers, as well as just in the data, is our, our officers are taking more guns off the street, uh, making uh, just as many, if not more, arrests for uh, for violent crime and uh, solving more ho homicides, at, solving homicides at an unprecedented rate right now. They're, they're working hard night and day. And I do think it's important to say that. I, again, I'm sorry about uh, what you experienced, Sean, and, I, and I'm happy to, uh, to look into it. And I'm sure the uh, police mm -hmm. department would as well. But I do think it's important to acknowledge the work that the police are doing and that they're doing in partnership with many others. Uh, but they're, they are out there working hard. So we'll have, make sure a producer shares Sean's number uh, with your office, uh, Mayor Bronin. But uh, let's get into uh, what you just referenced. Uh, this was something that we wanted to talk about as well. Uh, a release put out by the Hartford Police Union. I believe the president is uh, Anthony Rinaldi. Uh, in response to a, the wave of shootings, the statement coming out October 13th, a part of that statement, I'm going to read it for our listeners who may not be aware. Uh, he writes, our elected officials can blame the health pandemic and related matters to this wave of violence. He writes, sadly, the truth is that police officers are taking a step back and not proactively patrolling their communities due to the uncertainty and vagueness of the Police Accountability Act. That law went into effect October 1st. He goes on to say, if police officers are not supported and given the tools needed by the government, uh, crime will continue to rise. Criminals are becoming more brazen due to the lack of proactive policing. That is a vital part of keeping our communities safe. So uh, give us some statistics uh, to back up what you're saying, uh, Mayor Bronin, that the police um, are doing their jobs uh, and refuting what Anthony Rinaldi is saying. Sure. Well, look, I think one thing that's important to keep in mind is that the law that he's referencing is a Connecticut state law, but the spike in gun violence is happening in cities across the country. Uh, it, it's not unique to Connecticut. Uh, you know, there are cities that are experiencing even more severe spikes in gun violence than we are. You know, if you look at cities like, uh, you know, Louisville um, or um, Kansas City, and, and you can go on and on down the list. So I think uh, just at that most basic level, I, I don't think that you can look at a Connecticut law and attribute a national trend to that law. But but the other piece is, is what I said before. Uh, if you look at the arrests that our police are making for illegal gun possession or for gun violence or for auto theft, which is often you know, linked to gun violence, you often see a nexus between auto theft and gun violence uh, or uh, homicides, you're seeing our police make as many, if not more, arrests across the board. And those are the most dangerous situations where our officers uh, have to lean forward the most and put themselves at risk. And, and that's what they're doing. And so, you know, I've spoken to, to the union president, Tony Rinaldi. Uh, you know, I, I, I respect him. And obviously he has every right to, uh, to express his opinion, including on that bill. Uh, but I think, it, I think it does a disservice to the men and women of the Hartford Police Department to say that, they, that the reason we're seeing violence is because they're not doing their job. I see them doing their job uh, with as much dedication as ever. Mm. 
Deborah Davis, I wanted to get your take on this uh, as someone, again, that's in the community uh, talking to people in Hartford that have been impacted by gun violence. You said community members are also fearful they will become targets. What do you think about um, this uh, exchange between the police union and leaders like Mayor Bronin, this idea that police uh, may be dialing back uh, because of this accountability law that just went into effect a couple of weeks ago? Um, and I and I actually have to agree with the mayor because um, historically and um, just so recently and within the last couple of weeks and the last couple of months, years, et cetera, um, we have had a really good working relationship with the police department. And um, we do and, and we and I have to agree that the gun violence has spiked across the country in all of the cities across the country. And be, because most of the um, of the sales of purchasing guns has gone up too tremendously, so we do. So I do agree with that specific um, part of this conversation because it's important, and we articulate this, and we do make certain that people know that we work um, in support of our police department. It is so important for us to have that relationship in order to provide the assistance for our community members that have been victimized. And even after they've been victimized and traumatized, we work with the police department to help identify ways and other areas of how we can actually help to bring those individuals to justice as well. Because part of this entire process is once a um, family member has lost a, a family member, et cetera, they have to have some some resolve. And most of that resolve comes with making certain that that particular person is brought to justice. And in that effort, um, we do make certain that there's communication between the victim of the community and the police department, making certain that they maintain those communications um, to help in the process and not wanting to be another target or another person victimized, even another family. So that's all part of the prevention process as well in terms of not having uh, an, another victim and another victim uh, based upon um, that one gun and then that one incident being utilized um, in a community. Because I think a lot of folks sometimes believe that there's so many numbers of people that are just shooting. And really, it sometimes is basically just that one gun sometimes and that one gun that has traumatized an entire community and that one and that one shot basically that actually um, takes a toll on a family then our community it actually just takes over the that 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 entire community and um, the entire community becomes traumatized so in working with the police department in the past and even now we have tried to establish that it's important to have a balance Yes, it's important to have a balance. And it's also important for organizations like ours to have the resources to help with those with those activities. And so that's a very, uh, very in important um, uh, relationship for us as well as community partners. I want to fit in one more uh, caller before we head to break. Uh, Candace is calling in from Hartford. Candace, go ahead. Hi, yes, I wanted to comment on the previous statement regarding the police union and police um, stepping back due to the new policy and law in place. Uh, my first comment was that I think it's a cop-out and that they don't want to be held accountable. It's not the actual reason why crime rate may be increasing. And my second point is that they feel that is the truth. They need to resign because if they feel they can't do the duties of the jobs, then they need to be released. Thank you. Thank you, Candace, uh, for calling in to uh, where we live as we again talk about gun violence, uh, not only in our capital city of Hartford, but uh, around the country, especially during the pandemic. Uh, I want to thank Deborah Davis uh, for joining us. She's programming coordinator for Mothers United Against Violence. Uh, Deborah, thank you for being on the show. You're welcome. Hartford Mayor Luke Bronin will continue uh, to stay with us as we continue our conversation. You can join us too. Find us on Facebook and Twitter at Where We Live.
This is where we live on Connecticut Public Radio. I'm Lucy Nalbethanchel, broadcasting remotely. The Connecticut State Police have helped cities like Hartford deal with spikes in gun violence, usually during the summer months. But it's not summer anymore. But that help is needed now after the capital city has seen a record number of shootings in the last two months. Over the weekend, during an online meeting, Mayor Bronin and Hartford Police said 15 state troopers will help local law enforcement on an emergency basis. Mayor Bronin, uh, tell me more about um, how the state police will be assisting your police department. Sure. So, uh, again, you know, we we always work in partnership with state and federal law enforcement uh, officials, um, again, as well as with our community partners. Uh, but uh, in response to what we've seen, I asked uh, Governor Lamont and uh, and Commissioner Ravella to dedicate uh, additional investigative resources to Hartford, uh, which uh, which I'm grateful that they did. The 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 state troopers that are working with us are primarily on the investigative side. You know, they are uh, detectives, uh, sergeant uh, who are supplementing our violent crime unit detectives, our uh, narcotics uh, unit detectives, uh, who are, of course, not just just not really focused on narcotics uh, alone, but on the nexus between narcotics and gun violence. So it's primarily a- about investigative support. And then there's a little bit more, you know, they, they are also uh, upping their uh, their presence and patrols on the 84 and, and 91 corridor uh, to try to uh, help address the, the auto theft side of this. Because as I said before, there is a link between auto theft and some of the gun, gun violence that we're seeing. But I think what's important to say is, you know, we're, we're not going to see state police out on the streets of Hartford, patrolling the streets of Hartford. That's not what this partnership is. It's a a specialized and investigative partnership to uh, try to uh, do our best to identify shooters uh, and, uh, and, and get them off the street. You mentioned earlier about some disruptions happening in the court system that are impacting what you're seeing in Hartford. I believe uh, court closures, individuals released from custody, lack of supervision for parolees. And so how are you working to address that with either the state's attorney's office or the uh, or the uh, court system? Sure. So, you know, we have uh, a a new state's attorney uh, in Hartford, in the Hartford region, and she's just been in there for a few weeks, but we've already built a really strong partnership, uh, and uh, we appreciate that partnership very much. Uh, But as you said, there's no question that there has been a, among the disruptions of the pandemic, was a pretty significant disruption to uh, the court system and uh, to wait to the way that that was working. So you had a period where uh, court really just was was not happening um, and cases were not being heard. Uh, you had the suspension of in-person uh, parole and probation supervision. And you also had a number of situations uh, that I highlighted in the town hall that I did this past Saturday where our police had arrested individuals uh, for involvement in gun violence and and for very serious crimes. I'm not talking about low-level crimes, but for serious crimes and that those individuals uh, had stayed out either because the bonds were set very low or because they were released on promise to appear. And I do think that that is tied also into the pandemic and the understandable reluctance uh, to to have, um, uh, you know, people uh, uh, to, to have more people uh, in in jail and in confined spaces. And, and I want to say, you know, I'm a, I'm a strong proponent of bail reform. I think that the current bail system uh, in many ways is discriminatory, in many, many ways penalizes poverty. Uh, but what I think we need is a real focus on a risk-based system where somebody who really is involved in violence and threatening people's lives in their community uh, faces a consequence and is actually uh, taken uh, out of the violence equation when they're arrested. And we just had not seen that in, 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 a, in some really, you know, some, some cases where the, the, the facts were, were pretty, um, pretty ugly, where, where we just hadn't seen that happen. Before we broaden out uh, this conversation to what's happening nationally, and I have to ask, you know, so often 
in these kinds of conversations about spikes in uh, gun violence or spikes in crime, we're talking about reacting to the problem. And and I'm wondering, uh, you know, as mayor in, in this national conversation we're having about policing and how communities should be uh, interacting with the police and vice versa, that there's so much emphasis on the law enforcement side. And so when you're thinking about uh, your coming budget and we hear Deborah Davis talk about the uh, persistent trauma in the community that has yet to be addressed uh, so many other things happening in people's lives you know how do you shift your priorities uh, to provide resources to help people with mental health and trauma before something happens where there is crime involved the, the, it's absolutely right and this this is this is something that we have been working hard to do and and I I talk about some of the things we're doing but I also want to say at the start there's there's no question that I think on a national level on a state level uh, and, and across the board uh, we need a a totally different level of investment in mental health uh, and in uh, response to trauma uh, and uh, you know I I hope Hope that when we get past this election, we get a, a new administration in Washington. I hope that uh, that we'll be able to see some changes there. What we're doing at the local level is a number of things. One, uh, we built when I came in, we built something called the Youth Service Corps, uh, which was designed to be an employment opportunity for hundreds of young people in our community each year. We raise money privately; it's about two million dollars a year that is invested in that where the money uh, goes directly to supporting employment for young people who have been disengaged and disconnected, and some of whom may be uh, you know, either tangentially or even more directly touched by some of this violence. Um, and using the, the, the promise of a job as a carrot to help get that young person and connected not just to the job opportunity, but to a broader set of supports and mentorship. Uh, but the reality is we also have a lot of young people who are not even ready for that, uh, who who need a, a different level of support even before that. And so we're working with organizations like Compass. I know we're going to hear from, from Jackie Santiago, but working with organizations like Compass, Compass which the city uh, funds and, and who we work alongside uh, to secure additional funding from philanthropic sources uh, to support their work. We've also focused on the re-entry side because there is a connection there too. You know, we have uh, hundreds and, and uh, many hundreds of people come back every year to Hartford uh, having served time. And as a community, we need them to be successful. So we built a reentry welcome center inside City Hall. That's something we'd like to expand, uh, but it's something that I hope is a, is a model that, that other cities uh, will follow. Um, but again, uh, and then lastly, let me say this year we committed uh, to building a crisis response team that is focused on mental health, that is uh, a team of civilian uh, you know, social workers and mental health professionals who are responding to cases in which you know members of our community are experiencing serious uh, emotional uh, distress, uh, mental health, acute mental health challenges, and we set aside funding over a, f uh, a four-year period to to design and really scale that up. Um, so we funded that with $5 million uh, over the coming four years. Uh, those are a few, I could say, say more, but, uh, but again, all of that is important and all of it is insufficient. We have to do more and I hope that uh, we are able to see a different level of focus uh, on the federal side as well. I'm glad you brought up young people. You know, this past summer, I talked to Deshaun Palmer. He's a Hartford resident, grew up in Hartford, and he graduated last spring from Pathways High School. And he told me, uh, when we're talking about this, during a pandemic and so many students uh, going remote last spring, he saw the struggle, not only within himself to complete uh, his work, but also how his classmates were struggling. This is what he told me. Some students actually didn't even make it to the end of their senior year. Some of them just dropped out and took the opportunity to just stop with school a whole as a whole. And um, some students, it was just so much of a change that like our highest students would drop down to like D's and F's just because it was so not, you know, interactive. 
Mm. Deshaun uh, told me that he did get support from his teachers and counselors that motivated him to finish out his senior year. He graduated. He's now a freshman at Southern Connecticut State University. But again, he saw so many of his classmates who didn't make it through. So I want to bring into the conversation now Jackie Santiago, CEO of Compass Youth Collaborative, again, uh, another organization working with uh, Hartford Youth. Jackie, welcome back to the show. Thank you, Lucy, for having me today. It's a pleasure to be here. I wanted you to respond to what Deshaun shared and as well as what you're seeing and hearing from youth today about other traumas they're experiencing. Uh, Obviously, we're in a pandemic, so it's been challenging for everyone, but how it's exacerbated among the youth uh, that you're serving. Absolutely. Thank you for this time. Really, the pandemic has shed light on an issue that we've had for a while, and youth are now feeling another pressure added to them. The reality is that we need to look at different ways to approach uh, and engage youth. I think they need mentors and support in the classroom. Additionally, youth have experienced disengagement long before the pandemic. Uh, They just are not interested in the usual way that we deliver uh, lessons in the classroom. Uh, there are other other nation, other uh, cities around the nation that really focus on technology and engage kids learning and have them direct their learning. And we haven't yet arrived there, but I know that we're making great strides to do that. And so I think that's one of the issues that we're experiencing. Additionally, you know, you will hear you say on a regular basis, whether it's education, or whether it's violence in the community. They're saying that they need mentors, that they need role models, that they need people to help them uh, navigate the opportunities that there are and overcome the obstacles that they're seeing, especially in a time during a pandemic when no one has ever seen things like these before. They need people to help them process their feelings, help them Mm -hmm. pause and think about their actions before um, they do something that would be detrimental. Um, to their lives. And so I think when we talk about situations like this, it really comes down to the resources, but community can also help. And I know that we have a lot of leaders in the community that are willing to step up and help out with with this kind of thing. But Mm. Compass is proud to have a team of peace builders that are working in schools, we're working in the community, we're working to address crisis, because it is important that we're looking and tackling Mm. the various issues that are uh, hurting our kids Mm. now. So Jackie, can I... Uh, Jackie, can I ask, yeah. with the spike in violence alone in Hartford since September 1st, nearly 50 shootings, when you talk with young people, whether they're involved in a situation uh, within the last seven weeks or not, what isn't working to help them? Where are the gaps? They're saying that they need community members, that they need um, someone to be there with them, but they're also feeling uh, the disconnect. Uh, and and feeling fearful. Uh, Deb Davis talked about this a little bit, but they are fearful that there will be a next target. They're fearful that they won't be able to engage and have social communities like they're usually used to. They're worried about where they're going to get their next meal. A lot of it comes down to fear for not meeting their basic needs or fear for their safety. You're hearing Jackie Santiago, CEO of Compass Youth Collaborative. This is where we live. I'm Lucy Nalpathanchel. We're going to continue talking about this with Hartford Mayor Luke Bronin, and we're going to bring in a public health researcher to tell us more about what's happening around our country and measures uh, to help combat gun violence. Stay with us. This is where we live on Connecticut Public Radio. I'm Lucy Nalpathanchel. We've been talking about gun violence with Hartford Mayor Luke Bronin. Joining us now on Zoom is Linda DeGudis. She's a lecturer at the Yale School of Public Health. She's a former director of the National Center for Injury Prevention and Control at the CDC. Linda, thank you for being patient with us. Oh, thanks. Thanks for asking me to join. It's been very interesting to hear about all the work that's being done and all the efforts that are being made in, in Hartford. 
So Linda, give us some more context. So we're we're talking about something very local, a, a particular city. I know there's other areas in our state that are also dealing, dealing with gun violence. But from a national perspective, there's something our guest, one of our guests said earlier about a rise in firearm sales, especially during the pandemic. And, and as someone who studies this, what have we seen uh, na- nationwide since March? Well, we're certainly seeing increases in gun violence around the country. Um, and as the mayor said, it's other cities are, are seeing this as well. It's not unique to Hartford. Um, but we're also seeing increases in gun and ammunition sales. And we're certainly very concerned about that because there's a clear link between firearm access and firearm violence. And initially, when the emergency was declared in March, we saw a real spike in gun sales. And what we know is that almost 3 million more firearms have been sold since March than would have ordinarily been sold during this time period. And about half of that increase occurred just in June. Um, In March, there were uh, a lot of the sales, people were thinking about their personal safety. Um, You know, they were worried about the economic impact of what was going on. Here was this threat of this um, new virus. And that was probably the reason for a lot of those sales then. But in June, things were compounded because of, um, you know, the killing of George Floyd, um, evidence of racial injustice, protests that were going on, discussions about defunding the police. And so people felt even more of a threat. So um, background checks have increased um, daily uh 82 100,000 per day is the norm um now it's generally over 120,000 per day that are done wow. Wow. um in june early june the firearm sales or background checks uh there were 150,000 per day the first couple of days of june and it stayed up the whole month um so so we just know that this is really something that can contribute to the firearm violence, the gun violence that's mm-hmm. occurring and that we're seeing in the cities. And as um, you already mentioned, this whole issue of what happens during the summer, that we do see increases in um, gun violence during summer months, essentially every year. You know, it's a real seasonal pattern. Um, so on, on top of sort of the pandemic issues, we have our usual summer time spike mm. in gun violence. Uh, Linda, I'm wondering if you could tell us more about, uh, again, you, you laid out for us uh, the additional firearms that are in people's homes uh, since the mm-hmm. pandemic began, and what public health researchers know about uh, when there is a firearm in the home, how likely uh, there can be an incident, whether it's intimate partner violence or even suicide. Sure. Well, we do know, and we've known for quite a long time, that the risk of having a firearm in the home um, increases the risk of someone in the home being shot. Um, And basically, the presence of firearm in the home is associated with a two to ten times greater risk for suicide um, than in a home without a firearm, for example. Um, Intimate partner violence... uh, Again, when not all of intimate partner violence certainly involves using a firearm, but if there's a firearm in the home, there's certainly an increased risk that um, someone will be shot. And the other, um, the other thing we always worry about with firearms is it's a you know it's more lethal than another method of assault or another method of suicide. Um, it's it's a lethal means, and so the risk is greater. Um, when there is a firearm present. And layer on top of that, pandemic stress, right. Linda. So <laughs> what are some takeaways that our listeners can think about as well as uh, public officials like Mayor Bronin? Well, I think some of the takeaways, I, I think, you know, when Deborah mentioned um, the issue of mental health and the stresses that, you know, the mayor mentioned a lot of the stresses that people are facing, with a pandemic similar to what they face with other kinds of disasters, except that these are, this is going on for a longer period of time. Um, and with this pandemic, we're seeing 
you know, more and more social isolation mm -hmm. where people can't access their usual support systems. Um, youth can't access uh, some of the job programs that have been set up or some of the activity programs that have been set up in the past, you know, during a non um, non pandemic, I guess, time is the best way to say it. So what we really um, think about is one of the key things is thinking about what happens during this kind of um, event and any kind of disaster is saying, what are we going to do to retain any prevention strategies that we already have in place? You know, and I think um, several were mentioned, some of the um, crisis response teams, the, you know, uh, reentry center, which helps prevent repeated kinds of um, issues with violence and some of the, um, some of the sort of community based services um, that are really focused on preventing violence in the community um, and making it unacceptable as a way of resolving conflict. But the other thing is that um, we need to think about what examples are we setting as, um, you know, as a country, as a, you know, what examples our leaders are setting? Are they serving as role models in some ways? Are they encouraging violence or discouraging it? And by discouraging it, you know, I don't mean arrest everybody who's violent, but, mm. you know, don't, um, don't encourage violence as a means of settling conflicts. Um, some of the other things that we think are important, that we have thought are important for a long time, are some of the policies on both um, state and federal levels and, and some local levels to really um, decrease access to firearms for people who are at risk of committing violence. Um, and I, I would say that one of the things we need to keep in mind is that there are a lot of people who own firearms who are responsible, who take care of their um, firearms, you know, they store them properly, um, they don't leave them out where a child can pick them up, that kind of thing. So um, we, need to, we need to reinforce those kinds of strategies that keep people safe, even though there are firearms in our environment. Well, Linda DeGudis, I want to thank you for joining us, a lecturer at the Yale School of Public Health, former director of the National Center for Injury Prevention and Control at the CDC, uh, Hartford Mayor Luke Bronin. We just have uh, about a minute left. I wanted you to just respond uh, to what Linda shared and maybe some next steps your city will be taking. Sure. Well, I think that this point about the access to firearms and the availability uh, of firearms is a really critical point. And, you know, Linda was talking a lot about you know, the increase in, in legal purchases, but there's a link between the availability of firearms and uh, e stolen firearms and the illegal mm -hmm. trade of firearms. You know, there was a Hartford Current article that may, many listeners may have seen recently about an individual who was recently sentenced for bringing in 47 firearms to Hartford and trading those guns for drugs. Mm -hmm. That's one of the ways the guns make it to a, a community like ours. They also come from places like, uh, you know, Vermont or up from Virginia where the gun laws are, are more lax. And I think so far there's been sort of a, a national collective shrug about that. Mm -hmm. But there's a real tie because when people are feeling the stress they're feeling, and when conflicts happen, they escalate so much faster and so much more tragically when a gun is in the equation. And, and the last thing I said, you know, we had a lot of conversation about youth, and that's a critical part of this. But it's important to say a lot of the violence we're seeing is not among youth. It's among adults. And, uh, and again, it's where you see personal disputes escalating and the presence of an, an illegal firearm uh, uh, making that situation that much more dangerous. Well, we'd love to check in with you again, Hartford Mayor Luke Bronin. Thank you for coming on the show. Thank you. I'm Lucy Nalpathanchel. Today's show produced by Carmen Baskoff. Special thanks to Katie Tolarski, uh, who ran our board today. We'll be back tomorrow.